Okay, we are on chapter six of Kildy House. A week of camping out under the big oak tree made Jerome appreciate his house. He got four wood ticks on him, all burrowed in him so deeply he had to dig them out with his pen knife. He caught a cold, which gave him the sniffles. His stomach got upset because he did not know how to cook, know how to cook over a campfire, and a possum stole all of his bacon and eggs, and Jerome was glad to move back into his house. There was only a lingering smell of musk in his front yard. The headstone was lettered and in place. Emma Lou admired it very much. The first thing Jerome did when he got back into his house was to heat a tub of water and take a bath. He smeared the tick bites with salve, shaved, and felt very good. Old Grouch was glad to have him move back. He had never seen any reason for him moving out in the first place. He had slept in his box every night, but, he'd, but he had had to visit the camp for food. He was as fat as ever, but Jerome thought he was pining for his wife. He did not go off looking for another mate. Jerome pampered him and put up with his grumbling. Emma Lou roamed the woods with Ben's rifle, but she never saw Donald or Strongheart. She was sure she had won a complete victory. She did not know that Donald had sworn to have his revenge. Nothing had happened because he had not figured out a way to get even. Strongheart was no longer allowed to run in the woods. He had been sent to an animal hospital for dissenting. Upon his return, he was confined to the fenced yard. Donald had visited Jerome's Hill a number of times and had seen Emma Lou on patrol without her suspecting he was watching. Emma Lou would have doubled her efforts had she known he wasn't staying off the mountain. Jerome soon realized that he wasn't going to stop using his stonecutter's tools now that he had started again. He had an itch to do something else, not a headstone. He didn't ever want to make another tombstone. He finally selected a slab of rock and started upon a small statue. He decided to make a statue of Old Grouch. Working on it gave him a good feeling, and when he had the head roughed out, he knew it was going to look like Old Grouch. Emma Lou was excited about it, so excited he decided to give it to her when it was finished. Toward the middle of August, Papa and Mama brought the children into the house. They came marching in through the door, Mama first, then the five little ones, then Papa. The children were very much like their parents, only smaller. Mama led a grand march around the room before they gathered in, gathered in the center of the floor. Papa sat up and looked at Jerome proudly. Here's the picture. It was clear to Jerome that Papa was going to expect a lot of help from him in feeding this family. They were now at an age when they wanted to eat all the time, but were not able to hunt. Jerome knew he would accept the job. He set out two saucers of condensed milk and a plate of meat scraps, and the little skunks lapped up the milk and ate all of the scraps. No coaxing was needed to get them to try a new kind of food, and none of them had to be scolded for not eating. Old Grouch gave the skunk family a wide berth. He hopped up on a chair and sat watching them. Papa kept an eye on him, though by now he had come to consider Old Grouch a part of the fixtures in the house, like the chairs and the table and the bed. But he did not intend that the old raccoon should forget his place and try to nip any of the children. Emma Lou took the skunk family over as soon as they started leaving the nest. Jerome wondered if they would have to decide if they would decide to take up quarters in the house. They did not. If the chimney had not been in use every night, they would have taken it over gladly, but they did not like the open room. They liked a dark spot to sleep during the day. They considered Emma Lou a very special friend and would do anything to please her. One afternoon, she announced that she was going to stay for supper. She had never sat before the fireplace. She would light it up and sit before the fire with Jerome after supper. Her real reason was that she wanted to play with the skunks. They were at their best after dark, and she wouldn't have to coax them out from under the floor. Sure your family won't worry, Jerome asked. Job and Silly are in the city. The boys are up at the wood camp. There's nobody home to worry, Emma Lou smiled. Jerome grinned. He always thought it funny when she spoke of her mother and father as Job and Silly. He rather liked the idea, but it wasn't something he was used to. Emma Lou helped him with the supper things. She was eager to light the fire in the fireplace, but she waited until the dishes were washed and stacked away. Old Grouch ate a huge supper from what was left over. When he sat down beside his plate, his stomach hid his feet from view. You'll have to get his statue done before he gets so fat it won't look like him, Emma Lou said. Not much more to do, Jerome said. They moved to the fireplace and Emma Lou held the match under the shavings. The flame grew until it licked around the big logs and seating herself on the hearth, she pulled her knees up and locked her arms around them. Old Grouch waddled over and sat on the other side of the hearth. Jerome sat in his chair and puffed on his pipe. Have to cut some letter in on the base, Jerome said. What will you put on it? Just old grouch, Jerome said with a grin. Emma Lou stared thoughtfully into the fire. The light made her hair look coppery. It outlined her tipped up nose and her small chin, and Jerome thought he'd like to do a piece of work like that. He thought he would try it sometime. Emma Lou had been considering a nicer name to cut into the base of the statue. She couldn't think of any name that fitted the old raccoon better than the one that Jerome had given him. The seven little skunks came in for their milk and they disappointed Emma Lou by staying only a little while after they had finished their supper. Papa and Mama were giving the little skunks night lessons. A well-schooled skunk needed to know his way out after dark. Night was their hunting time. She tried to coax them into playing with her, but Papa and Mama were firm. They marched their brood out through the little door. Emma Lou returned to the hearth and sat down. 
Old Grouch burped a couple of times and then he dropped off into a sound sleep. This is wonderful, Emma Lou said. When I grow up, I'm going to have a cabin just like this. Will you build my fireplace for me? Sure, Jerome agreed. Then he frowned. But don't you want other things more than a house in the woods? I did have other plans, Emma Lou admitted. She blushed as she remembered what those plans had been. They seemed sort of silly now. A tall knight on a white horse and a castle and all that. A house like this would be nicer. I decided I'll have a cabin like this one. The other house, she did not say castle, was a lot bigger, but not nearly so nice. Suddenly, old Grouch cocked an ear and opened one eye. Then he opened the other eye and sat up, and he sniffed and chuckled deeply. Then he lifted his muzzle and gave a low, ooh. Jerome and Emma looked at him in surprise. Why, he hasn't sung a note since she died, Jerome said. He paused and looked toward the little door. It had opened, and a furry head was poked into the room. They both turned to watch the little door. A raccoon walked into the cabin, followed by a smaller raccoon. It was the slick one, and he had a little lady with him. The small raccoon seemed nervous, but the slick one just shoved her toward the center of the floor. They both sat down and looked around the room. He's brought home a bride, Jerome said. Here come two more, Emma Lou whispered. The little door opened and another pair marched in. They were closely followed by a third pair. The six raccoons sat down in a circle, and three of them looked eagerly up at Jerome, who had gotten to his feet and was standing beside the bed. They came back married, Emma Lou said, and she giggled. The strange raccoons looked scared and ready to bolt for the door, but old Grouch's children were not afraid. Runt didn't come back, Jerome said. Before Emma Lou could answer, the door opened and in popped Runt. She was followed by a burly fellow as big as old Grouch himself. She sat down in the circle and he sat down beside her. Old Grouch waddled off to the hearth and walked over to his family. He stood looking them over for a while and then he sat down beside Runt's husband and he too looked up at Jerome. Nine pairs of bright eyes regarded him. Nine faces beamed. And here's the picture. Ooh, that's a lot of raccoons. Jerome grinned at them and he wanted to laugh, but he was afraid that might scare the strangers away. He moved slowly to the cupboard and pulled the string and nine heads turned to follow his movements. It was clear the strange brides and grooms had been informed of what to expect. It was also plain to be seen that they were skeptical. Jerome fixed little squares of meat on a big platter and he added some bits of cracker and dry toast and he set the tray down inside the circle and went to his chair. Runt copped the prize of the season, Emma Lou said. I had a hunch she would. She's a smart one, Jerome agreed. Always was smart. Wonder if they'd run away if I tried to join them, Emma Lou asked. If they do, they'll come back. They've had a taste of that meat, Jerome said. Emma Lou got up and walked toward the circle. The four wild raccoons stopped eating and stared at her. Suddenly, Runt's burly husband broke and made a dash for the door. He went out with the three others close upon his tail. Emma Lou sat down and started talking to the raccoons. They ate hungrily, but they were polite enough to pay attention to what she said. Very soon, a furry face appeared at the door and Runt's mate peeked in. He watched the raccoons feasting at the platter for a minute, and then he barged in and joined them, shoving in at Runt's side. The other three followed. Once they were back at the banquet, they did not seem afraid of Emma Lou. Emma Lou looked up at Jerome and laughed. Before the rains come, you'll have 25 or 30 raccoons to share your house with you. The idea startled Jerome, but Emma Lou was right. He wondered what would happen a year from today. He did a bit of the arithmetic and figured he'd have more than 100 raccoons within a year's time. He had no doubt they would that they would all stay with him and he had a feeling they would all demand food. Hard to tell what may happen, he said cautiously. You'll have a house full of raccoons. That's what's going to happen, Emma Lou sighed. I wish Charmin could see them. She'd be proud of her children. Jerome frowned. He was wondering if he wouldn't have to chase them away. Emma Lou seemed to read his thoughts. You won't have to chase them away and they won't leave. I'll help you make nests for them. I don't know, Jerome said. It will be wonderful, Emma Lou said enthusiastically. I'll have to make nests. If I don't, there'll be a pound of stuffing left in my mattress. Jerome shook his head. He was remembering how Mrs. Grouch had helped herself to the stuffing in his mattress. I could donate this mattress to them and buy me a new one. There's an old one in our attic. I'll put I'll put the pack saddle on Frank and bring it up tomorrow. They won't steal the stuffing while you're in the bed. I wouldn't be too sure, Jerome said doubtfully. You wait and see, Emma Lou assured him. A half hour later, Runt let her maid over to the box in the corner and she left while the others were still picking up the few crumbs left on the platter. Old Grouch was already in the box. She hopped right in on top of him. He made a lot of noise and some fur flew as they tussled in the box. It was Old Grouch who got out and he moved fast for one so fat. Emma Lou and Jerome laughed. Runt was coyly coaxing her burly maid into the box. He was keeping one eye on Old Grouch and hanging back. Old Grouch turned his back on the pair and he marched to the fireplace and sat down. From the elevation of the hearth, he delivered an angry tirade at his children and his in-laws. Runt will get along, Emma Lou said, but I have to be running on home. You've been expecting this to happen, Jerome asked. I had a pretty good idea what was going on, Emma Lou admitted. I've seen them all in the woods getting it planned, but I was just lucky in picking tonight to sit by the fire. 
Jerome got to his feet. He smiled at her. He was sure she had been keeping a close watch over the raccoons and hoping this would happen. He thought she might even have had something to do with their homecoming, but he didn't mention it. The night was dark except for pale starlight, but Emma Lou had a flashlight. It was big and powerful light belonging to Ben, a light he sometimes used for purposes he did not talk about and which the local game warden would have considered very bad. So probably hunting animals he's not supposed to. Ben had taken his rifle with him to the wood camp, but Emma Lou was not afraid. There was nothing to be afraid of. As she moved along the trail, she did not flash the light. She could see well enough to get along. If she moved silently and without a light, she would hear many night sounds she was interested in. She knew a mountain lion had drifted up along the ridge and was playing, paying the mountain a visit. She also knew that a cougar was harmless so far as man went. Cougars knew they had no business bothering any of man's tribe. Any cougar and managed to live did it in spite of men with traps and guns who were all eager to kill his kind. Emma Lou had tried to catch a glimpse of this cougar. Ben had told her that a lion would follow a person out of curiosity. If he did, she might be able to flash her light on him and get a good look at him. She moved along carelessly, whistling softly. She hoped Ben was right about lions having a big bump of curiosity. She whistled, but she also listened carefully, and she didn't look back along the trail. According to Ben, if you looked back, the cougar would make off in a hurry. He'd know he was stalk he'd know you knew he was trailing you. Once or twice she was sure she heard the padding of big feet on the trail behind her, but each time when she showed her slowed her pace, she heard nothing except the usual night sounds. Crickets, rustling of a wood mouse, the hoot of an owl. Once she was startled by the sharp bark of a gray fox close to the trail, but deep in the thicket. She whistled at him and he answered sharply before making off. She could hear loose stones slithering down a bank as he scurried away. She came to a stop where the trail curved around a dell choked with woodwardia ferns. It was a spring gulch where the ground stayed wet all summer and the huge ferns grew higher than her head. Below the fern dell was a meadow which was almost flat. Emma Lou knew, Emma Lou knew that a doe had a late fawn hidden in the ferns, but she did not pause for a peep at the fawn. If a lion was following her, she certainly wasn't going to lead him to the baby black tail. If she kept right on, the lion would never know because a baby deer has no scent at all when it is very young. She was just below the fern dell when she heard a low snarl and then a bleeding scream. scream. The sounds came from the meadow. Emma Lou halted and gripped her flashlight. The throaty snarl had been deep and terrifying. She was sure it had been made by a lion. It sent a chill racing up her spine and for a minute she wanted to run away. The bleeding cry sounded again. It was even worse than the snarl. It was filled with terror. Suddenly she knew what was happening. The cougar was attacking the doe who had been feeding out in the meadow. Anger flared up at her and she did not stop to consider what she ought to do or what was safe to do. She just gripped her flashlight and started off the trail and down a little slope toward the meadow. She struggled through the mass of blackberry vines and after a half dozen steps, she came to the edge of the meadow. Shooting the powerful, powerful beam of Ben's hunting light out across the meadow, she picked out a tawny shape. She steadied the light and revealed a lank cougar. He had the doe gripped by the neck. She was down and half turned over. He was tearing at her neck savagely. When the light hit him, he leaped back from the doe and faced Emma Lou. His yellow eyes glared horribly. He snarled as loud as any zoo lion and lashed his tail. Emma Lou held the light on him. She was trying to yell, but she wasn't able to make a sound. The lion stood his ground, so she's calling the cougar a lion. A male cougar. The lion stood his ground for half a minute, then he whirled and bounded away. She stabbed the beam of light after him, holding it on him. Before he outran the light, he was making 20-foot leaps. Emma Lou stood where she was for a long time and didn't turn off the light. The cougar certainly had not looked like the cowardly beast Ben had said it would be. She shifted the light back to the doe. The doe lay in a heap and Emma Lou had a dreadful feeling that she was dead. Finally, she moved across the meadow to where the doe lay. Her eyes were open, but she was dead. Her throat had been slashed open and her neck seemed to be twisted, possibly broken. She remembered the fawn and panic seized her. She was sure the cougar would come back. He was probably sitting well outside the reach of her flashlight waiting until she went away. He might even be creeping toward her through the tall grass. She headed for the fern dell and did not turn off the flashlight. Her probing life found the fawn. Its big eyes stared at her from under a frond. Emma Lou moved in. She got the fawn into her arms. The little fellow did not kick or struggle. It snuggled against her and tried to pretend it was dead or asleep. After a tough struggle, she got back on the trail. She stood for a minute considering what to do, and then she headed upward toward Jerome's house. Jerome was seated in the chair before the fire when Emma Lou pushed open his door. She staggered into the room and set the fawn down on the floor. Its legs curled under it and it settled down, stretching out its neck and laying back its ears as it flattened itself against the boards. Jerome had been drowsing. He started and leaned forward, blinking his eyes, not quite sure he was seeing what he did see. There was wild scurrying and dim shapes darted from under the bed, from the corners of the room and out of the boxes. The fire had died down, and so there was only a rosy glow of light in the room. In less than a minute, all the raccoons were outside except old Grouch and Runt, who stayed in her nest even when her burly mate fled. Well, well, was all Jerome could say as he stood looking at the fawn. Emma Lou was out of breath. 
was so out of breath she could not explain for a few minutes. She sank down on the floor and began stroking the fawn's neck. The baby deer was no bigger than a large rabbit. Its spots showed clearly, but the rest of it blended with the floor so that Jerome seemed to be seeing only spots. He didn't ask any questions. He had got over being surprised at anything Emma Lou did. She looked up at him and sighed deeply. A lion killed its mother. He'll kill this baby too if we don't keep it there, she explained. Lion, Jerome repeated. He had no idea there were lions on this mountain. He thought she was talking about the only kind of lion he had ever seen, a great beast with a tawny mane. A mountain lion, Emma Lou explained. Ben saw him and he's going to hunt him when he gets done in the woods. You started home with a lion loose in the woods, Jerome stared at her in astonishment. They won't hurt a person, she frowned. In a way, it's my fault. I talked Ben into waiting to hunt the lion. I wanted to see him alive in the woods. Jerome opened his mouth, then closed it without saying anything. He shook his head. Looking down at the fawn, he said, well, well. You can keep it here tonight. After I milk Bess and Pinky in the morning, I'll bring up some milk for it. We'll have to bottle feed it. She leaned forward and rubbed her head against the neck of the little fawn. Poor baby, she whispered. You'll be snug and safe here. You can't walk down that trail alone, Jerome said firmly. We should have a gun. He looked about the room for a weapon. You better stay here tonight, he added. I should go home, Emma Lou said. One of the boys might come down from the camp. Jerome took a deep breath. I guess you should go home. I'll walk down with you. The minute he spoke, Jerome regretted it, but he didn't try to squirm out. Emma Lou didn't refuse to let him go with her. Now that she had time to think over it, she was scared. Jerome saw she was frightened and it did not make him feel happy. He had only a vague idea what a mountain lion looked like. All he rec could recall in the way of lions were what he had seen in the zoo. He remembered how the brutes acted at feeding time. He wet his lips and tried to manage a smile. I don't think it's a very big lion, Emma Lou said. It ran away when I flashed the light in its face. Ben says all mountain lions are cowards. Jerome shuddered. His re regard for Emma Lou's courage bounced upward. She had walked up to a lion and flashed her light in its face. He couldn't let her see that his knees were knocking together. I'll pull on my boots, he said. Guess the deer will be safe until I get back. And there's the deer just laying there under one of Jerome's coats. As he laced his boots, Jerome wondered what he could take along as a weapon. He finally decided he would take his stone mason's hammer, the heavy one with the long handle. At any rate, he knew how to use it and he wouldn't have known how to use a gun. Emma Lou moved the fawn over into a corner and covered it with one of Jerome's coats. Jerome armed himself with the heavy hammer and they started out. The trip down the trail was not marred by sight or sound of a lion. When they were opposite the scene of the kill, Emma Lou shot her light across the meadow. The carcass of the doe lay in the grass, but there was no sign of the mountain lion. The lion was at that instant swinging along a ridge five miles away. He was alive because he was wary and very careful. He was heading away from the place where he had been spotted by a human being. When they reached the Epi house, Emma Lou gave Jerome the flashlight. She felt just a little bit ashamed of herself now that they had covered the trail and the lion had not been seen or heard. I'll be up after I milk the cow, she said. We have to save that baby deer. Jerome nodded. He wasn't worrying about the fawn. It was safe at his house. He was worrying about the trip back up the trail. He did not know that the lion was far away. He was sure it was hiding along the trail. He climbed as fast as he could, and for once he did not take an easy pace with plenty of stops along the way. He kept shooting his light along the black back trail and off to the sides and up ahead. He heard quite a few sounds which could have been made by a lion, and once his light picked out a pair of glaring eyes. When the eyes appeared, he froze in his tracks, and they were very close and looked very big. Not being able to whirl and run gave him time to see what sort of beast the eyes belonged to. They were a fat possum. The light had blinded it, so it could not run away. As soon as Jerome shifted the beam, the possum went blundering off through the bush. After that, Jerome moved faster, faster. He was mu faster. He was puffing and his face was red when he finally reached his house. He got inside and would have barred the door if there had been any, any bar. He snapped the flimsy latch shut and stood look, looking at the door. He was glad he had made the little door so small so a lion could not squeeze through it. Jerome tossed a few small pieces of wood on the bed of coals in the fireplace. When the flames leaped up, he saw that all the raccoons had come back and were sleeping here and there about the room. The fawn was asleep under his coat. None of the brides had taken the trouble to raid his mattress. That would come later on when he got to thinking about families. Old Grouch poked his head out from under the bed. He had pulled a pair of Jerome's pants off a hook and wadded them up for a bed. Runt peeped over the ledge of her box. She reminded Jerome of her mother. He smiled at her and she gave a coy look before she snuggled down beside her husband. When Jerome went to his bed, he found one pair of raccoons on it. He moved them to the floor where they sat blinking and looking abused as he undressed and got ready for bed. Before he dropped off to sleep, he decided it was time he gave some thought to his household problems. They were piling up on him fast, but he was too sleepy to figure out what he ought to do. Tomorrow, he would do some figuring. He sighed deeply and dropped off to sleep. That's the end of chapter